Amen. All right, keep your place in Romans chapter 5. So we've been preaching through the book of Romans for the last few weeks. And Romans chapter 5 is actually one of my favorite chapters in the book of Romans. And we're going to um, destroy a couple doctrines, a uh, couple false doctrines tonight through uh, Romans chapter 5. But I also want to explain Romans chapter 5 to you. Um, it, it can be confusing when you just read through it um, quickly like that, but I want to, um, if I don't, I'm going to try not to go through, down too many rabbit trails here, but so I want to explain the context of the whole thing, but I also want to destroy these two doctrines because people have taken some verses out of Romans chapter 5 and based some pretty wicked things off of uh, those verses. So we're going to explain that as well. So in Romans chapter 1, we saw um, the Gentiles were guilty before God. In Romans chapter 2, we saw the Jews were guilty before God. In Romans chapter 3, we bring that together and we see how everyone is a sinner, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans chapter 4, we looked at, you know, then in Romans chapter 3, kind of wraps it up and it's, it's, you know, we're saved by grace, by faith, and not of works. And then we looked in Romans chapter 4 last week at how our faith is the same faith that Abraham had. So the gospel is the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. So there's no um, dispensations of people getting saved different ways throughout history. We're all saved the same way, by belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, Romans chapter 5, let's just go ahead and get started. Let's look down at num verse number 1. And the Bible reads, therefore being justified by faith. So I love in, in Romans how he just, he continues with the first verse in every chapter, picking up right where we left off. Therefore being justified by faith, because that's what we talked about in Romans 3 and Romans 4, is that how it's not of works and we're justified by what? Faith, okay? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also you have access by what? Faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible right there. Okay? Now, notice how Paul says we glory in tribulations. So what are tribulations? Tribulations are, are things, persecutions that you're going to go through in this world. Okay? Things, you know, persecutions for your faith. The Bible says, turn your Bibles to John chapter uh, 16. John chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. John chapter 16. Because the Bible says that you will go through tribulation in your life. And Paul here is saying that we glory in tribulations. Okay, so let's look a little deeper into this. If you're there in John chapter 16, look at verse number 33. And the Bible reads, These things I have spoken unto you, that in, in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It says, ye shall have tribulation. You will. For sure, you will. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you will have tribulation. And then in 2 Timothy 3, in verse number 12, I'll just read it for you. He gets a little bit more specific, and the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So, you will face persecution in this life, especially if you live godly for Christ Jesus. Okay? And the reason for this is, as you start to change, as you get saved and you live godly, and you start you know, changing your life and going to church and listening to the, what the Bible says and reading, you know, that's going to make people mad. And you're gonna, and you wouldn't think it would, but you're gonna, you're gonna realize that it, that it's going to, all right? Because everybody else in this world, you have to understand, is stuck in this status quo, okay? And what I mean by the status quo is what I mean is just what's normal now. And the status quo is constantly changing, okay? In our culture, what I'm talking about is the culture today. Is the culture today getting better? Or getting worse as we went through the axis of evil and we read all those statistics are those statistics getting worse or better according to the Bible they're getting worse I mean people are getting more and more immoral and the, the sad fact is that the people that you know that aren't saved they're just following that status quo down that hill and as you place the Bible as your standard and you lock in on that standard you're gonna get further and further away from where those people are and those people will persecute you for that. They will not like that. 
Because people that are following the world, they want validation. They want someone to be doing it with them. They don't want to see you locking in and staying somewhere where you're getting further and further away from them. So everybody else is moving with the culture. So you see you will face tribulation. And that is one for sure I can guarantee you if you start adopting the standards of the Bible that you will face. I hope we don't face more serious tribulation than that like the apostles and, and many Christians throughout history who were martyred and killed. Um, but it's possible. You know, it's possible. Turn to uh, Matthew 24. So the Bible says that tribulation will work, at, work patience. So what does that mean? Well, patience means that when you're going through hard times or when you're going through tribulations, that you just have the character to know that that time will pass. You know, whether it will pass with someone cutting your head off, like with James, or it will pass by it just, you know, being a short tribulation that you're going through in this life. And patience worketh experience. Once you go through those things, the next time you go through those things, it won't seem so bad. That's what that means, okay? Experience. You know, what makes you experienced with something is not reading about it, is not learning about it, is not hearing it from somebody else, but it's actually doing it. It's actually being there and going through it. I've said this many times um, about engineers. It doesn't make you, if you go to school and get an engineering degree, that does not make you an engineer, in my opinion. What makes you an engineer is the ability to engineer something. And the way you get, learn how to engineer something is by having experience engineering things and getting better at it, okay? So patience worketh experience. Now tribulations, are you there in Matthew 24? So we know that the next time that they come, they'll be easier because you have experience now. Now here's one reason you might need experience. Look at Matthew 24 and verse number 29. The Bible reads, immediately after the tribulation of those days, meaning the tribulation is something that we have gone through, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, that's all the believers, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So the Bible clearly teaches that we will go through the tribulation before the rapture, which is what we just read about there. All right? So now, patience, tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience what? Experience hope. Okay, so once we've gone through it, once we've gotten experienced, now we have the, the hope that you know, times will be better. And you know what? If you've ever gone through hard times and looked back at hard times, you know that that gives you hope. You know, I think about you know, hard times that we've had in our family, like financially hard times in, in my life with my wife. Those are some of the most valuable times to look back on because they give us hope and they help you know, give us hope for the future. Right? And valuable, valuable lessons are learned from hard times. So we see that, you know, we also get hope. So that's just a great um, little chain of, of words there that Paul puts together for us. And if we continue in verse number five, the Bible reads, Romans 5 and verse number five. And hope, just continuing with this thought, maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure, peradventure means perhaps or possibly, for a good man would some even dare to die. So what the Bible is saying here is, you know, people would hardly die, give their life, even for a righteous man. Okay, okay, and then he says, okay, well maybe, maybe, perhaps, for a really good person somebody would give their life. And then look down at number, uh, verse number 8. But God, he's contrasting verse number 7, but God commendeth, meaning he presented his love, or commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. So what he's saying here is that, you know, in your life, you would, you would hardly ever, most people would not even want to die for even a really good person. But God, when we were just 
sinners. We're just sinners. We're guilty. God showed His love toward us and that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. When we, were, we're, we weren't good. We weren't great people. God didn't say, look at all those great people down there. I, I must send my Son to die for them. He's saying, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, you're in Hebrews number 12. I'm going to uh, continue reading here. Just keep your place there. In verse number 9, the Bible says, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now the word atonement, we've received this atonement. The word atonement means uh, a reparation for a wrongdoing. So it says we've received this atonement through Jesus Christ. The word atonement is so... Uh, it, I, when you actually look up the definition in the dictionary of atonement, it actually says one of the meanings is reconciliation to God through Jesus Christ. That's how powerful that word has become in our, um, in our, in our vocabulary. So, we see that we've received this atonement. Now, you see how we've, received, we've been justified by His blood and we've received this atonement. I'm going to read for you Leviticus 16, verses 15 through 16. And this is describing the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. And the Bible says this. It describes what happens in the Day of Atonement. And the Bible says, this is the priest. He goes into the Holy of Holies. And then the Bible says, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So before this, he had killed a bullock for himself, the priest, and then he had two goats, and he killed one um, for the sin offering, and he let one go for the scapegoat. Okay, and that's picturing uh, Barabbas being let go. And in verse number 16, he says, And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions and all their sins, and so shall he do it for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So you see that there is this once a year um, a sacrifice that the priest would do for the people. It was a sin offering for the people. So what was it for? Look down at Hebrews um, chapter 10 in verse number 1. And the Bible says this, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, you see that it says it's a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So he's saying the sacrifice that the priest did would not make the people perfect. It could never do that. All right? For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. Now just remember that. And let's look at verses 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So what was the point? So the, the, he was going and sacrificing this bull and these goats, and it's not possible that those, those sacrifices should take away sins. So what's the point? The point is in verse number 1 where it says, it's a shadow of good things to come. So those good things to come, it was just... It was a shadow of the coming Christ. That's what it was. And the beautiful thing about this, if you look at verse number 2, where it says, because if they did take away sins, what verse number 2 means is that they would have only had to do it once. Because if, the, if killing the goat took away your sins, see, because God is not down with work salvation. He, he, he never is. This is eternal security right here. So, He's saying that if the blood of the bulls and the goats in the Old Testament would have actually cleansed the people of their sin, you would have only had to do it one time. That's why Jesus only had to come, because Jesus' blood did cleanse us of our sin. It's the, it's the main event that these things were just symbolizing. They were a shadow of, of what was to come. Okay? You see, those people in the Old Testament, they had faith in what was to come. And this sacrifice was just showing what was to come, which was the real sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the atonement and the justification through His blood. Okay? Now, look at Hebrews chapter 9, just one chapter back, and we'll see the importance of the blood here as well. 
In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, the Bible reads, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So Christ, was, and then if you just jump down to verse 28 for uh, sake of time, the Bible says, So Christ was once offered, once, to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Just one time. That's it. So the blood of Christ was good enough to just cleanse us one time. That's eternal security right there. All right, now look at, um, we're going to kind of change gears here in verse number 12, Romans 5, verse number 12. And we're going to hit the first heresy right here. So let's first read verse number uh, 5 and verse, Romans 5 and verse number 12, I'm sorry. Where the Bible says this, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed among, upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, there is a huge heresy taken from this one verse, and that is the heresy of original sin. And if you've ever grown up in a Lutheran or Catholic and, and probably some other Protestant, any, basically any Protestant religion that baptizes babies is going to use this verse to, to prove original sin. Because you remember how last Sunday I said to you that the Catholic would teach that if you get your baby you're driving home from the hospital and your baby hasn't been baptized and you get in an accident, you know, that baby is not saved. That baby is going to hell. Because the baptism is a means of grace for that baby to be saved before they can actually understand what's going on. Well, they use original sin. And the original sin is this, that they use verse number 12 to say that basically we are all guilty of Adam's sin. Okay? We're all guilty of the sin, the specific sin that Adam committed. Okay, now is that what the verse says, first of all? No. Does it say that we're all guilty of Adam's specific sin? As a matter of fact, if you go to verse 13, or go to verse uh, 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. The thing about stupid heresy is if you usually read like one or two more verses, it disproves the stupid heresy. But it's a serious heresy because a lot of false doctrine is built on the doctrine of original sin. So I was raised thinking there's original sin and then there's actual sin. Those were the two sins. It, the original sin is the sin that, you know, I'm just guilty of when I was born because of what Adam did. I'm guilty of that sin. And actual sin is the sins I actually commit. Okay? Now, all right, where am I at here? Look at, well, here's the definition of original sin. Original sin may be taken to mean that the sin that Adam committed, a consequence of this first sin, the hereditary stain with which we are born on account of our origin or descent from Adam, that we are all made direct sinners being guilty of Adam's specific sin. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 24 and let's disprove this very quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24. And while you're there, let me read to you Ezekiel, while you're getting there, I'll read to you Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Is that confusing? No. Right? There's some confusing things in the Bible. That is not one of them. Look at Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16. And we'll, there's another confusing verse. Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. That's confusing. Right? No, that's very simple. So what's our Bible reading rule, right? When you, you always base doctrine on clear scriptures. So if you're reading the Bible somewhere, and first of all, you would never come up with original sin on your own. You just never would. A saved person reading the Bible would never be like, oh, I'm guilty of eating the apple. <laughs> it, it doesn't even make any sense. 
right? So you always base your doctrine on clear scripture. So when you read something confusing that could have two or three or four meanings, but you have clear scripture, let's say it's not of works, lest any man should boast, you go with clear scripture, folks. If you, you, you're, you're interpreting it wrong if it goes against clear scripture, okay? Now, you can't be cursed. I mean, you can't be found guilty of someone else's sin. That's, the, that's what the Bible says, very clearly. However, I do want to clarify a, a, you know, a, a, a main theme in the Bible. You, personally, can curse future generations. Yeah. All right? And the Bible clearly teaches this. Okay? And I'm going to separate these two for you. Turn to 1 Kings, and we're going to look at this. All right? There's a difference between being put to death for a specific sin and cursing um, another generation. We're going to look at the sins of Jeroboam. Okay? Look at 1 Kings in chapter 15. And we'll look at how someone cursed future generations. Okay? And we'll look at how it fits in with um, what the Bible said in Deuteronomy chapter 24. In 1 Kings 15 and verse 33, the Bible reads, In the third year of Asa king of Judah began Basha the son of Ahijah to reign over all Israel and Terzah twenty and four years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin wherein he made Israel to sin. So you're going to see many kings where the Bible says he made Israel to sin. And then he walked in the ways of Jeroboam. But what is he guilty of? He's guilty of, in verse number 34, he did evil. He's guilty of the evil that he personally did. Now, you can see this if you just look at somebody who grew up in a house whose dad was a raging alcoholic. There's, there's a very like, great chance that, that the kids in that house are going to have problems with drinking. Because they're cursed with that sin. They've been brought up with that sin. Jeroboam made Israel to sin because he was the leader of that nation and he was worshiping false gods. He put up idols, he was worshiping false gods, and the people of Israel came with him and worshipped those false gods too. But those people in that nation were guilty because they did it personally. Okay? You can't miss that. There's a very clear distinction there. Okay? So you can be cursed by your father. You can curse future generations. Think about that. Especially if you're in a leadership role. You can curse your children. Think about divorce. If you came from a, if you are a child and your parents were divorced, and I'm not saying you can't overcome this, don't under, misunderstand me, but what I'm saying is if statistics show that children whose parents were divorced are 50% more likely to get divorced themselves. That's, that's a curse on them. Because it's something that they've been exposed to, they probably take it less seriously. Now, of course, you can take, you're personally responsible. You can take your life wherever direction you want to go. And you can fix that personally. Because you're personally responsible for your own sins. Right? But I'm just showing you that you can curse future generations. But those generations are ultimately going to be responsible for their own sins. Okay? Amen. Now, on the flip side of this, it's not all bad news because you can be a great blessing to your, to your future generations as well. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. I want to show you where somebody was a great blessing to future generations in the Bible. 1 Kings chapter 11. And look at verse number 12. Well, let's start in uh, verse number 11. We're talking about Solomon here. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, he is David's son, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. He's talking about the split that's going to come in the next generation. Notwithstanding in thy days I will not do it for David thy father's sake but I will rend it out of the hand of my son. So God's basically going to curse Solomon. Or he's going to tell us, he's telling Solomon, because of all the things that you've done against me, he's like, I'm taking the kingdom away from you. But I'm not going to do it in your lifetime for the sake of your father. Because of who your father was and the promises that I made to your father. So David was a great blessing on many people. Look at 1 Kings 15. Let's look at another uh, blessing. We're a couple generations down. This is David's great-grandson. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. Talking about Abijah. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set his son up after him and to establish Jerusalem. 
for David's sake. Once again, he showed mercy because of a couple generations back. So this is who you could be. You know, your great-grandson, your great-granddaughter could fall into something horrible and God could literally look at them and say, you know what? For your great-grandfather's sake, I'm going to have mercy on you. I'm not going to destroy your life right now. Amen. Let's look at a few generations down. Let's look at Hezekiah, 1 Kings chapter 20. In verse number 6, 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse number 6. And the Bible says in verse number, uh, let's look at verse number 1, start reading. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now that I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, before Isaiah was gone out into the middle of the court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day. Thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Now he was a humble man and he appealed to God in a humble way. But in verse number 6 we see something else. And I will add unto thy days 15 years and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Once again, God is still blessing people for David's sake sake. I mean, that could be you. Think about that. All right. Now, let's continue in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. In verse 13 through 17, we're still kind of talking about original sin here. I'm not done with that. But I want you to notice that verses 13 through 17 are in parentheses. So it's kind of a, you know, a side note. And in verse number 13, the Bible reads, For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Now, this does not mean that from Adam to Moses, you know, no one was condemned. Okay? And people teach that too, which is weird, because read one more verse down. And in verse number 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So all you have to do is read one more verse. All right? But turn to Romans 2 and verse 12 real quick. Let's look at what this means in verse 13. Romans 2, in verse number 12, the Bible reads, For as many have, as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. As many as have, have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So in Romans chapter 1 especially, and in Romans chapter 2, we found out that the law, even though people didn't, the Gentiles did not have the law, the law was written where? It was written in their hearts. So they were still guilty before God. The same applies before the law of Moses came into play. Plus, God had many laws. In Genesis chapter 9, you know, he, he instituted a law against murder, you know, when Noah got off the ark, you know, an eye for an eye. And, you know, God had many laws. It's not like there was not any law at all, but the law was always written in our heart. But what Romans 13, Romans chapter 5 and verse 13 is really getting at is that for un, when it says, For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Turn to Romans chapter 7 and verse number 9. And I'll explain that to you. In Romans chapter 7 and verse number 9, the Bible says, But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of con concupiscence, for without, which is lust. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. Now, when is the only time in your life when you were unaware of the law? Amen. Amen. Is when you're young, a young child that's too, too young to understand the law of God. Now, children will do wrong things all the time, from the time that they're born till the time they're, you know, whenever, right? Depending on how much you spank them. But the bottom line is, Children are born with a sin nature. That is what the Bible teaches. We've inherited a sinful nature from Adam. We, ha we are not guilty of his specific sin. We, we inherited a sin nature. So children just automatically would be born, and from the time that they're one, two years old, they'll just be doing things wrong. They'll just be, you know, messing things up, and, you know, then when they're two or three, they're going you know, to lie to you. Did you take the cookie? No, I didn't take the cookie. You know, and all that kind of stuff. It's, just, it's in their nature. They have a sin nature, but they don't understand the law. 
So the law, sin is not imputed to them. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Now, look at what it says in, uh, it continues. For I was alive without the law once, when I was a young child. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When I understood the commandments and the Bible and the law even written in my heart, if no one taught me the Bible, and I knew that it's wrong to do things, that's when I became guilty. See? That's the age of accountability right here in the Bible. And you will notice this with children. You will notice uh, my children, they, it, they will come to you when they're six, seven years old, and they'll start asking you questions. Um, am, I, am I going to heaven? Because I'm, I'm a sinner. I do bad things. And they'll start asking these questions when they hear um, the Word of God in church as they sit in this church. And they sit and they hear the Word of God. They will start asking you questions about how to be saved because they know that they're guilty. That, that awareness, you can, you can just see it flow into them at certain ages. And it, you know, this is no specific age for you know, any one kid. But you know, if, if they're 18 and they haven't figured it out, you know, it's probably a problem. Because you can definitely understand. Now, but the law when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. So it's the law that drives us to the need for salvation. Amen. You see? Okay. Go back to um, verse number 14. Romans 5 and verse number 14. And the Bible reads, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So it's saying, it just, it just sums it all up right there. It says death reigned from Adam to Moses even though they didn't sin the same way that Adam did. It's like because they had the law written in their hearts and God did have rules. God had laws. Who is the figure of him, him to come? And that means you know Jesus is called the second Adam. And we'll see that in a few more verses. So just because men didn't sin the same way Adam did, but they still sinned. And they still broke the law that was written in their heart even before the law of Moses came in. So there's original sin. It is completely heretical, used to justify baptizing babies. And, you know, I've even heard pastors say that aborted babies go to hell. I mean, what kind of wicked teaching is that? It's crazy. So you just have to, t you know, you have to, we'll talk about this at the end, but you have to kind of like recognize these things that the law is written in your heart, and you don't have to have the Bible memorized to know when something just doesn't sound right. You know? Okay, verse number 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through, I mean, how many times does the Bible have to say that it's a free gift and not of works, right? I mean, it's just, it's like the dozen, it's more than a dozen times already in just Romans. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So it's by one man, Adam, we all inherited this sinful nature through one man, Jesus Christ, we're all freed, is the free gift. Okay, in 1 Corinthians 15, go ahead and turn there. We see this again. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 21. And the Bible reiterates this, where it says, For since by man, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. It's great. All right, Romans 5 and verse number 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they received abundance of grace, of the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life by one Jesus Christ. End of parentheses. So, once again, just we're freed by one man, Jesus Christ. And by the way, so original sin, we, you know, we debunk that, but we've inherited this sin nature from Adam. And the Bible teaches that you inherit your sin nature from your father, from Adam is our father. You notice how the Bible said in 1 Kings, it said Hezekiah, David's father. The Bible will always, you know, it'll reference father even if it's your great, 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 great grandfather at many times. But our father, Adam, is who we've inherited our sinful nature from, our sinful flesh. Now, this is why Jesus had to be born of a virgin, by the way. 
because he did not inherit that from Adam because God was his father. You see? You see how perfect it all fits together? All right. Let's look at, uh, we're out of the parentheses. Let's, let's bust up another uh, heresy here. Calvinism, which is, I, I didn't grow up around any Calvinists, but it's one of the stupidest teachings I've ever heard. I mean, like, you, you can't be an intelligent person and believe Calvinism. Because the, the Bible is, like, like, is this, here's another confusing verse. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men, Notice all men. To condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon a chosen few. Is that what it says? <laughs> even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. I mean, this isn't hard to understand. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. The Bible teaches clearly that God wants everyone to be saved. If it was up to God, if it was up to the will of God, no one would go to hell. No one. It's not his fault. Okay, if it was up to the will of God. Let's look at the will of God. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. And verse number, let's start in verse 3. For this, good and accept, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have, that means he wills, have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God w wills that all men are saved. He would, he would like that. That's His will. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. If you don't believe me, we'll look at another one. We'll look at the flip side of this and how many people God wants to go to hell. Oh, but God, you know, he, you know how many people does God really want to go to hell? 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 9. And the Bible reads, I'll wait for you to get there. Is everybody there? We'll wait. God would love it if we all would just accept the free gift and, and, and go to heaven. Amen. I mean, how hard is it to accept a free gift? You know what I mean? I mean, how hard is that? 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. That means any go to hell. He's not willing, He's not wanting that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance meaning turning to Jesus, belief in Jesus Christ. Okay? God is, if everyone would just be like, I, I, just, I want to just turn from whatever I believe and just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God would be all for that. That's right. But unfortunately, you know, not all will take the gift. We see that every Saturday and every Sunday. We're like, here's a free gift. Do you want it? Nope. Cooking ramen noodles. People don't want it. You know, people are wrapped up in this world. I mean, insert any stupid reason. You know, whatever. They're too busy. They don't care. They hate God. It's not God's fault that people turned on Him, became evil, became wicked, and He gave them over to a reprobate mind. He didn't start the fight. But you're dead sure He's going to finish it. So it's not His fault. Look, he, He's the one. He gave a way out. He paid the whole thing with His Son. Imagine one of your kids. Imagine seeing one of your kids beaten and tortured and killed and then burned in hell for three days. Imagine that. He gave one guy, one guy was out soul winning and he's sitting in his lawn chair and he's like, he's drinking a beer and he's like, what's God ever done with me? And I'm like, let me tell you what God's done for you. You better listen. And I told him what God's done for him. And he's like, oh, you know, maybe he gave him something to think about because you think you've just, you know, he, first of all, he gave you this life so you could waste it, sitting there drinking a beer, you know, uh, uh, just wasting your life in drunkenness. You know, I mean, he gives you this, th everybody gets a life, right? Everybody gets a life and they just, he's just wasting it. And then he gave his only son, who was beaten and tortured and killed and took the punishment 
for your sin, fool, and then he offers it to you as a, as a free gift and you don't even want it. Is that God's fault? No. Nobody's, nobody has an excuse here, folks. I mean, nobody has any kind of excuse. I mean, what more do you want? He paid the whole thing. He's not asking you for a dollar. Just believe. I did it all. Just believe it. That's it. All right, Romans 5.19. But yeah, Calvinism, I mean, who will have all men to be saved, not willing that any, you know, these are hard words, all, any, these are hard to understand. The free gift came upon all men. It's crazy. I mean, how, how, it, it's arrogant, I think, maybe is where it comes from. Maybe it comes from a place of uh, pride, is where I think it comes from. All right, look at verse number 20, Romans 5, 19, or I'm sorry, Romans 5, 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. See the theme here? Adam and Jesus. Romans 5.20 Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. That's to show us, to drive us to Jesus Christ. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter your past sins. They can be wiped away. Amen. Okay? Because grace will abound even more. Okay? Now, let me just say this about original sin and Cal Calvinism. Turn to, to Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. You can tell people are unsaved when they create these stupid doctrines out of single verses. And you know why you can tell they're unsaved? Because... Even if you don't have like chapter and verse memorized against these doctrines, what if somebody came, what if there was somebody that you knew really well and somebody came up, you had known this person for 10 years, 15 years, and somebody came up to you and said, hey, you know, Brother Frank, you know, he, he did this and he said this. You know, don't you think you'd be like, well, that doesn't sound like Brother Frank. I've known him for 15 years. He wouldn't have done something like that, right? That's how the Bible should be to us. That's, what, that's the importance of getting to know the Word of God. Okay? So when somebody says something, you don't have to have the book memorized, folks. But when somebody says something that is contrary, because these themes are throughout the entire Bible. Look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. The God of the Old Testament, God's personality, his, his how he feels about sins, it's the same through this whole book. This idea that there's a New Testament God that's really nice and is the Jesus that's holding the sheep with the cane. And then there's Old Testament God who's a meanie head. He's mean. He's mean to people. He kills all those people all the time. It's weird. You know, it's the same God. Je Sheep Jesus doesn't exist. Sheep Jesus, he's fake. He's made up by liberal Christianity today. It's a bunch of garbage. So as you learn the Bible, you're, starting, you're going to start to get to know God. And as your kids grow up in a Bible-preaching church, they're going to start to get to know God. So when somebody comes up to them with a picture of Jesus with the sheep and long hair, they're going to be like, whoa, that's weird. Get that away from me. You know? Or they start teaching these weird doctrines like Calvinism and that suck a lot of people in. They're going to be like, you know, that just doesn't sound like the God that I know. And then they'll look into it and the Bible will show them that it's not the God that they know. Right? Look, God wants everyone to be saved. Some he'll, have to, he'll give up. He'll turn over. But it's not his fault that this world is, is, is producing evil people, that people are following this status quo down into the gutter deeper and deeper and deeper, and they're dragging their children and the further generations with them. It's not God's fault that that happens. And original sin is just... It's something a saved person wouldn't get by just reading the Bible. It, it doesn't even sound right. So folks, we just need to know the Bible, okay? You need to be reading, 
You know, the Bible says in Acts 17 that the people in Berea, they, they searched the scriptures daily. Amen. You know, you need, to be, you need to take some personal responsibility with getting to know your Bible. That's, that's the application that I'm going to give you tonight. All right? In, in Romans chapter 5, you know, we saw that there's some verses that are pulled out of context, but we see that we've inherited this sin nature from Adam. You know, we see that because of what the Bible really teaches is that we've inherited this sin nature and that by one man, by one man, we were all condemned by, in that we're all inherited that sin nature, but by one man we were freed from it. Amen. And that one man is Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you for um, this deep doctrine, Lord, that just it disproves you know, all this stupid stuff that people teach. And we, we just thank you for the truth of your word, Lord. Lord, I thank you for these people. I thank you for this church. I ask that you bless the rest of our week. Bless the soul winning this weekend. Um, church and the fellowship to come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.